We are uh, here now to begin the session. Uh, we had uh, rather delayed lunch, so I hope uh, all could get it and uh, are settled in terms of how uh, uh, we are going to go forward in this uh, idea of uh, macroeconomic cooperation and possibility of a common currency. So uh, this is extremely exciting and uh, as was mentioned, uh, uh, would be contributing in terms of uh, uh, the details that we have been discussing in terms of how regional cooperation actually can uh, uh, can uh, can be undertaken uh, f uh, from the point of view of promoting trade, investment, technology, and finance-related uh, uh, linkages uh, within the region. And I think uh, uh, this is important in terms of identifying uh, the broad contours of uh, of our partnership. Uh, today, those of you. Uh, uh, what they in the inaugural session I mentioned about uh, uh, the uh, very uh, uh, stellar performance of the South Asian region on, on, on issues related to macroeconomy. Honorable Governor uh, delineated uh, ways in which uh, this cooperation can happen and, uh, and cooperation at the macroeconomic uh, level can, can actually be addressed. In fact, uh, his uh, remarks uh, were 360 degrees. I asked for getting those uh, remarks and, and uh, they would be shared with uh, a CPD and then I'm sure it would be circulated. So we have the broad context laid out, the broad contours uh, are, are there. The uh, uh, focus on uh, on regional integration, I think, uh, is important uh, now, uh, more from the point of view of uh, 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 finance and, and, and the sectors that are there. In the subsequent session uh, on the eminent persons group, we heard discussions about uh, the growing uh, uh, multimodal connectivity within the region. So if we think of uh, uh, areas for cooperation, I, I see that uh, uh, the issues are important uh, in terms of our uh, uh, connectivity, and connectivity is not just uh, 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 physical connectivity, but it also requires uh, uh, connectivity which is digital, connectivity that is bringing in our banking and finance uh, 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 together. Uh, and uh, uh, um, uh, also uh, trying to bring in uh, uh, dimensions of uh, um, uh, um, uh, cooperation which is uh, important uh, to give impetus to finance and finance related linkages uh, within the region. And I think it would be important for us to see how digital connectivity, uh, connectivity that can uh, quickly facilitate banking and, uh, and transaction related commitments for our business integration, I think would be important. The uh, third point that I want to make uh, is in terms of reducing the transaction costs. Because if business has to pay a lot of transaction costs, the sense would not emerge in terms of the priorities that we want. So how do we reduce uh, uh, would taka and, uh, and uh, rupee or rupeya uh, uh, transactions possible? Uh, can we reduce uh, uh, this transaction even by uh, the digital currency uh, that is possible? Uh, how we implement digital currency and in what direction uh, it, this should go? Where do we stand uh, in the region uh, in terms of uh, efforts that are on? Some of you might be already aware uh, that there are efforts going on for uh, uh, de-dollarization to reduce uh, uh, dollar transactions and, uh, and uh, improve uh, the uh, linkages among our banks and our uh, and BFCs, our uh, exporters and export houses uh, for payments and payment re related clearances. So, uh, 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 the uh, the effort that is on, if you pick up uh, uh, the uh, uh, the uh, uh, BIS uh, uh, November issue uh, of of last year, you would find a detailed review of uh, efforts that are on for uh, uh, alternative currencies. If we don't target dollar alone, what kind of efforts have been made? And you find that in last three years, uh, the total global transactions that are happening, 9% of that has uh, non-dollar transaction. And, and, and this was in July 2022. 
in December 2022, this number went to 14 percent. So, this uh, rise in non-dollar uh, uh, currency usage in settlement of global payments uh, is an indication of uh, rising arrangements that are there. But for our currencies uh, that have to go in, uh, uh, there are uh, six important dimensions of uh, what uh, internationalization of currency may require. And, and this is where uh, the Reserve Bank of India, RBI, uh, is uh, uh, paying great attention in terms of uh, Indian rupee uh, to have that. And these six characteristics are, uh, of course, uh, uh, keeping track of the geographical uh, um, uh, uh, sort of entities that where uh, geopolitical dimensions are becoming extremely important. The second is, of course, the strength of the local currency. With continuous uh, 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 sort of playing around with rate of interest in the U.S., it is becoming much more challenging for the global south to maintain the level of currency that is needed. But with the open market operations, uh, uh, we are uh, uh, able to. Uh, sir, please join us. Uh, we can bring in a chair here. Uh, 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 can you please? Yeah, sir, please come. So, uh, 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 so this uh, dimension of engagement with uh, uh, maintaining the value of local currency uh, is extremely important. The third important dimension is sound macro. Uh, uh, economic fundamentals and that I think is important for us to focus on on what kind of macroeconomic fundamentals are important for our currencies to uh, uh, to go forward. The fourth is uh, 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 sort of good investment opportunities that our economies offer. The fifth is low currency volatility and sixth is low and uh, and stable inflation and this is where uh, increasingly uh, emerging markets are uh, uh, trying to uh, do away with uh, uh, the IMF prescriptions that have been there in terms of where do we uh, focus uh, when it comes to inflation and uh, uh, the growth opportunities or employment opportunities. And fortunately, uh, at the Reserve Bank in India, we have been successful in maintaining the balance uh, in all these six points that I have mentioned. And, and from that point of view, uh, uh, to promote the Indian currency, as Dash would uh, discuss later, uh, India has introduced the Vostro accounts that are there, the special rupee Vostro account, which are now facilitating Indian rupee uh, uh, sort of settlement. And even with uh, uh, different countries like with Singapore, with UAE, uh, we have settled uh, 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 the payment uh, opportunities in rupee. So now uh, 38 countries have shown interest in settling India's trade transactions with them in Indian rupee. And this is a major uh, 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 sort of recognition of the six factors which I just now uh, explained. And that's also the reason why JP Morgan uh, has now included uh, uh, India in the bond uh, uh, index which would be operational from June 2024. And this would give... Uh, uh, new uh, uh, opportunity for us uh, 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 to have the dimensions of engagement. When we talk about local currency settlement system, uh, we also need to see uh, uh, a couple of points which are of importance. Uh, uh, the uh, uh, dimensions that are there, all our South Asian countries should have correspondent banking system. Now what is happening is Citibank or uh, uh, other international banks, uh, uh, HSBC, etc. Our transactions when happen through international banks, it, they uh, invariably raise the transaction cost. I deputed a research team from uh, my institute, RIS, uh, to do the work with Nepal. If India and Nepal do not have a direct rupee payment and we resort to dollar, uh, to pay, the cost of transaction goes up by 28 percent. And, uh, and we interviewed uh, uh, people who are doing these transactions in Nepal. And unfortunately, India in 2012 
issued our exim policy where we encouraged uh, exporters to earn dollars for uh, uh, for india to have a uh, foreign exchange reserve but we did not realize that we did not give any exemption to nepal which now only uh, in 23 the reserve bank and the finance ministry have given the concession to have india nepal uh, trade settled in indian rupee second is uh, market determined exchange rate uh the third is choice of settlement and uh, and uh, uh, the denomination that we require uh, them to be settled and then of course invoicing currency uh, with the end users so it is important that we have clarity in terms of how uh, uh, the cross border uh, uh, transactions would happen and what kind of uh, uh, a current account uh, 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 transaction and what kind of permissible capital account transaction we require and and for that you require trust you require safety you require liquidity you require uh, uh, settlement facilities to come up and al also uh, uh, integrity of the of the system and this would get an impetus uh, when we are adopting new technologies particularly information uh, communication technologies in the banking and finance i am chairing the it committee of the uh reserve bank of india where now as all of you might have gathered uh, we are uh, experimenting for last one and a half years uh, with the digital currency and indian rupee as a digital currency right now uh, 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 being tested at two levels one is the cbdc w which is among the wholesale uh, uh, operators and the other is uh, 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 cb uh, uh, dc for uh, retail and this is largely for uh, uh, closed user group uh, in which uh, dg rupee uh, uh, is being uh, experimented with so so in this session what we are today trying to do with this uh, very eminent panel that we have is to see how banking finance information technology governance of this reduction of uh, 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 costs of operation are possible and once uh, uh, we have accomplished it the world is looking at uh, us because we have the ability to produce goods at very very cost effective rate our agriculture is uh, largely uh, organic uh, with great market support uh, we have ability to uh, achieve scale of economies at at no cost as i mentioned south asia as a whole uh, constitutes almost 20% 24% of the global population so we have the market we have the ability the question is integration and question is also to go above narrow political considerations and bring in economics to guide uh, our our uh, uh, sort of accomplishments that are there i realize that uh, uh, we do not have all the speakers who are listed uh, uh, but uh, uh, only two persons have the powerpoint to uh, uh, to use uh, um, uh, i would encourage that we discuss and and if uh, powerpoint can be avoided because the kind of room we have uh, somebody would have to get up and i don't know whether you can see the screen but let us try if it is workable workable otherwise uh, we would uh, just go ahead and uh, i have been told that we have uh, around 1 hour 25 minutes and i have uh, speakers that i'm seeing uh, on the list so uh, uh, let me uh, begin with dr zahid hussain uh, uh, who would be uh, 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 presenting the perspectives that are uh, that are largely in terms of uh, issues uh, that we need to go forward with but i see that uh, he hasn't uh, you you are there okay very good so uh, uh, so we uh, uh, you would have powerpoint uh, yes. yes so let us try Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, there are many domains of macroeconomic cooperation: currency, payment systems, trade, tourism, investment, migration, and policies. I'm going to focus on just the first one, the currency part. And let me uh, go back to the foundations. Start from the basics of macroeconomic cooperation on currency. What what guidance do we have from the economic research that has happened over, over several decades? 
if if I want to reduce it to uh, the bare minimum, that what are the conditions for currency cooperation? Then we know generally that cooperation is likely to happen if the benefits exceed costs for all parties involved. The benefits come from reduced transaction costs and exchange rate risk, and the costs come from the constraint on macroeconomic policy options that are available at the individual country level. So now. Under what conditions can we expect that the benefit from macro cooperation on currency would exceed cost for all the parties involved? Now, we know generally that there has to be complementarity in bilateral trade, which could emerge from different comparative advantage or differentiated products, or what generally is called gravity, which is proximity or culture or history. And then there has to be free flow of labor and capital between countries. And the member countries have to be facing similar shocks, not idiosyncratic shocks, but covariate shocks. And then there must be a supranational institution which is able to manage whatever arrangement there is. Now, there could be two types of possible outcomes here. One is a common currency where two or more countries, not necessarily sharing national borders, adopt a fit-for-purpose single currency as their official currency. And by fit-for-purpose, it means it has to be a unit of account, it has to be a medium of exchange and a store of value. And a common currency, in my view, is a yes-no combo thing. It's, I say it's yes, it's every country's currency, but no, it's not any particular country's currency. So that's what we mean by common currency. And you, when you don't have a common currency, then c there can be a vehicle currency, which is like a language that, like English, we are using here. So if in the absence of a global common currency, transaction costs can be saved for all parties if they use a vehicle currency in global trade settlements. Now, what are the ground realities? What, what does experience tell us? Now, the history is mixed. We have the euro as common currency, which has survived, even though member countries are not all very well integrated, as theory suggests. For example, Portugal, Italy, Ireland, Greece, and Spain, they are part of euro, but despite their low international competitiveness, large wage differentials, and language, cultural, and distance difficulties. We have the proposed Asian monetary unit, which I would say is MIA, missing in action. Even though ASEAN is as suitable for a common currency as Europe was prior to the Maastricht Treaty. Now, the AMU is a common currency basket, but it's, it is neither official nor used in practice. Now, we had also talk about, I don't know how they pronounce it, the El Sur in the Latin American countries, which literally means the South, Argentina, Bolivia, Chile, Brazil, Colombia, all of them have very good soccer teams, but this dream has not been fulfilled. CFA Frank is one in the African continent where eight West African and six Central African countries are, are using it, but this is seen as a colonial legacy. And of course, we have this special drawing rights, which is not really a currency, but it is an instrument used by the Bretton Woods institutions for their internal accounting purposes. And even though it's not a currency, it does have an exchange rate. What we do have is the outsized role of the US dollar as a vehicle currency. Uh, I provide you some information that outsized means the dollar invoicing share is about four times its share in U.S. imports from the world. It's three times its share in U.S. exports to the rest of the world. Compared to that, euro invoicing share is only 1.2 times for imports and exports. 
U.S. is even more dominant in third country trade, where the U.S. has no involvement in it. So Bangladesh is exporting to, say, Cambodia. The invoicing takes place in U.S. dollars. And that's where uh, even e euro is, is not seen that much, the presence of euro. And of course, there, are, there is dollarization, where five U.S. territories and 11 foreign currencies use U.S. dollars as their currency. Now, so the a natural question that arises is why, how do we explain this uh, dollar dominance as a vehicle currency? Uh, there are many factors. I put them into four buckets. One is the history, which is the post-war rise of the U.S. economy, offshoring leading to expansion of global value chains, increased significance of multinational corporations, and a dysfunctional international monetary system, which is the dollar fill the void there. And then, of course, the institutions that U.S. dollar is considered a safe haven. And because of rate stability and faith in U.S. institutions, and if you look at that chart, USD index has been remarkably stable over decades. And if you, the trend line is almost near 100, which means that on, on, in the long run, the U.S. dollar has to be absolutely stable. And then, of course, there is inertia. A lot of research has happened on that, and that the research showed that if a firm has been using the U.S. dollar for its transactions in one market for a long time, and then it enters a new market, it is more likely to use U.S. dollar. And then the, there is herd behavior that if everyone else is using U.S. dollar as invoicing currency, then I have every incentive to use US, the same thing. Now, what are the alternatives? I, I'm not going into the discussion of why we are seeking the alternatives. Let's suppose that we, we want alternatives, and what are they? Now, there's, of course, the talk of de-dollarization, and we have recently seen over 70% of trade between China and Russia has now settled in their respective local currencies, and this has been rising. This has since, in October 20, February to October 22, it has risen by nearly 84. The BRICS countries want to import and export in their own currencies, and then there are several bilateral in, and regional initiatives to reduce dollar dependence, such as Saudi Arabia ex exporting oil to China in yuan and Asian clearing union countries negotiating payments of import duties in their own currencies. The, the clearest sign of de-dollarization is in the dollar share of global currency reserves, which has dropped from 72% in 2000 to 59% today. But uh, elsewhere, we don't see much progress in, in de-dollarization. Now, I do want to mention here, Mr. Chairman, as you mentioned at the beginning, that there are two bilateral initiatives involving Bangladesh, which has happened recently. One is the setting up of U yuan accounts, where Bangladeshi banks are authorized to hold in their Nostro accounts, yuan, like they hold US dollars and Canadian, Australian dollars and euro and all. So yuan is now added. You can have those. And that can be used for settling transactions. And then we had the Taka rupee arrangement recently, where Bangladeshi businessmen uh, sell goods and services to Indian counterparts for rupees. Two, or two bank, Bangladeshi bank, the Shonali Bank and his EBL allowed to open rupee Nostro accounts with the State Bank of India and ICICI Bank. Income earned in rupee from these exports, which is deposited into those accounts, can be used for imports from India. And other banks, if they want to do their transactions, they can do the transaction through the two designated banks. Now, there are claims and counterclaims made about what are we getting from these deals. The claim is the saving, conversion cost saving, that, you know, importers need to convert taka to dollars and then to rupees for, uh, to rupees for trade, and that has additional costs. Same goes for uh, uh, yuan. But there is also the counterclaim that when you are invoicing in dollars, trade with China and India, 
then where is the conversion cost saving come from? Because we used to convert taka to dollar then, and now we are converting to taka to rupee or taka to yuan. So there was single conversion before, there is single conversion now. So where is the conversion cost savings coming from? Now, of course, experience is the ultimate judge. So far, we have seen somewhat muted response to rupee trade. Uh, we don't have well systematically collected data, but media reports says that not many LCs have been opened in the, under this arrangement. And the yuan accounts that have been opened, they are not very active. So the arrangements are there, but they are yet to take off. It may be a little premature to judge them, but so far progress is very slow. Now, the viability of arrangement like this, bilateral arrangement like this, are subject to certain constraints. I put them into three categories. One is, there is this huge structural imbalance in trade between Bangladesh and India and Bangladesh and China. The chart provides the data on monthly trade deficit. This is Bangladesh Bank's data. Average trade deficit per month with China is about $1.1 billion. An average trade deficit in India per month is about $644 million. And these two trade deficits tend to be correlated over time. Now the question is, if I am exporting to India and getting rupees, but then I have an excess payment of $1.1 billion that has to be made, where do I get those rupees? Now, of course, one solution is that uh, it is so the, the trade is bounded by the amount of exports we make in rupees. If you want to do more, then there has to be some kind of a currency swap arrangement with the RBI and the People's Republic of China where the, the balance is met by, by Bangladesh Bank providing taka to RBI and RBI you giving Bangladesh the rupee to settle the trade deficit. So the swap is one possible answer. But of course, there are trade-offs. This Bangladesh would reduces dollar dependence, but it also loses a natural hedge from dollar invoicing because most of our export earnings from Europe and the United States, Canada are in dollars. And if we, so if we are buying in, uh, earning in dollars and uh, buying in some other currency, we are subject to an additional currency risk. India and China, they gain in global currency dominance. They want their presence felt. They also accumulate taka balances, but they also lose the dollars that they otherwise would have received from Bangladesh to settle the deficit. So the final question then is, uh, is an, an, an arrangement like this sustainable? Now, swaps, one-way swaps cannot go on forever. And the outcomes will depend on, as RBI and People's Bank of China accumulate taka balances, what are they going to do with these takas? They can import more from Bangladesh, they can invest it in Bangladesh, they can restructure it to convert it to some longer term debt, which India has done for certain countries recently, the most recent case I know is Malawi, and they can later convert it into hard currency. But the how this is done will determine the outcomes that, that happens later on. And also, there is a sustainability issue because Bangladeshi banks holding rupee reserves, they are exposed to potential exchange rate losses. The rupee fluctuates more than the US dollar and even the yuan, which is quite tightly managed. So these are, these are the issues that, that make the viability of these arrangements not quite obvious. I mean, we will see what future holds for us. Now, for in general, in the South Asian context, I think there are many hurdles to currency cooperation. One is low intra-regional trade, which is just 5% intra-regional, compared to 25% in ASEAN. There are high barriers to mobility, non-tariff barriers, all of, all of these countries have complicated visa policies, and then the bureaucracies are extremely rigid. 
There is also a very high degree of sensitivity to national sovereignty issues. National currencies evoke strong attachment and emotions. Now, if we want to cooperate on currencies, we can't have our cake and eat it too. You have to give up something if you want to get into a cooperative arrangement. The advantage with vehicle currency is that it does not take away policy sovereignty as much as does a common currency. Then the shocks that these countries face are not similar, not symmetric, not always covariate. In fact, SAC member states research shows more often adjust against each other than against a common external partner. The supranational institutions that we have so far, for example, SARC Finance, has not grown beyond information exchanges, and ACU is limited to netting payments. It has not grown beyond that. And then, of course, lately we are, you know, all these global geopolitical issues has given rise to talk of fragmentation, and this chart I've taken from the IMF's most recent World Economic Outlook, where they are... The chart shows in these boardroom meetings that happens between, between corporate offices how many times they mention the word fragmentation. So this is the call-in data on fragmentation. So the, you can see the rise in this number of times the word fragmentation is used in official meetings. Now whether this new remapping of global trade based on friendshoring and all that will be a boon or a bust, we, we don't know for currency cooperation. So in conclusion, I would say let's keep hope alive. It's not all hopeless. Currently, I don't think South Asia is suitable for a currency union, but going forward, greater economic integration will increase incentives for monetary cooperation. The terms of trade and financial shocks have become more common. But, and I think we need to operate the already established regional financial cooperation arrangements more effectively rather than reinventing new forums. Now, the multi-billion dollar, which is a pie in the, square, in the sky question, is what is the end game of greater monetary cooperation? Is that going to be a new currency, as in Europe, a currency of one member state, or some other variation in South Asia, all of Asia or some other combination in the continent or beyond is best left to the future for now. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, thanks a lot, uh, Dr. Hussain, for uh, exploring all different uh, facets of this uh, challenge in the region and also uh, uh, exposing us to the uh, larger challenge we may end up with given the kind of choices we make. So, so thanks a lot, uh, friends, colleagues, uh, particularly my panelists. Uh, the time allocated for the panel is eight minutes uh, per person. Uh, I have uh, somebody who are uh, there uh, who would, again, have uh, uh, eight minutes uh, to his credit. Uh, over to you now. Thank you very much. I might not need uh, eight minutes after having uh, so exhaustive presentation from uh, Dr. Zaid Hussain. Uh, as he said, actually, um, the possibility we should look forward for having a common currency. Before that, there are some uh, precondition. Uh, first of all, you can say very uh, complementarity. That means you should have, uh, first of all, you should not have any border in between the country. And this is uh, the first and foremost requirement. That means uh, free capital and labor mobility is required. If you look back to the European Union, they did have, uh, before the common currency, they did have that kind of facilities. That means if you have visa for one country, you can move uh, across the countries way, way before the European Union and uh, common currency have established. After that, we have also seen um, uh, one of the uh, dominant country, dominant member like United Kingdom opted out of the uh, uh, European Union uh, for obvious reason, actually. Uh, what are those reasons? Actually, uh, when you have a currency, you, you do have some, uh, from the central bank point of view, you do have some uh, asset liability aspects. That means when you uh, uh, flood some currency, that is kind of a liability. Who is be going to bear the liability? This is a question of uh, uh, management, question of uh, controlling the, uh, these liability and asset things. So uh, in that respect, other precondition that you need, uh, the comparability of the uh, economies. 
if you uh, sense, if you have some countries kind of uh, uh, dominant in nature, and then uh, you will be actually uh, lagging behind, or you will be actually not there yet. Um, to me, I have one example that uh, take it, taken initiatives for uh, in favor of having a common currency, particularly in the Southeast Asian region. Professor Haribans Jha in uh, 2017, he actually came up with a, a proposal that uh, we, we do have, we might have a common currency and also he also proposed a name. The name was Rupa. Rupa means uh, uh, it comes from Rupiah because India, Pakistan, Sri Lanka, Nepal, their uh, currency name is rupee, so rupa, r u p is there, and then for taka maybe a is there. So uh, for some reason it is not there because of again the dominance, dominance is come forward, particularly uh, to if I want to name it, it's like uh, China, India uh, is, the, is a factor. Other than that, you uh, we are actually uh, even if we are very close uh, border uh, with other countries, but we do have a huge disparity in, some, in terms of culture, in terms of religion uh, issues. If you cannot address those kind of issues, it's actually far cry, it's, it's not possible. Uh, to me, I likewise, uh, uh, Dr. Zahid Hussain actually, uh, we are not there yet, it's far, far away. Um, you, you need to uh, surrender your uh, policy uh, 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 independence, you don't have any policy, and also uh, it will be, uh, no, nobody's currency, and uh, you have to sacrifice your own uh, currency things. I don't know, country like India will be agreed to do that. Uh, in order to uh, implement these kind of things, definitely there are much, much benefit of it. Uh, that benefit will equally benefit you, you know, to the poor, uh, to the uh, weaker versus stronger economy. But the sacrifice from the stronger economy point of view, to some extent, may be uneven from the uh, weaker economy. and. Then what are the possibility? The possibility, uh, there are a lot of noises around after uh, Russia-Ukraine war. There are instability in a uh, lot of countries is facing. To avert that instability in terms of uh, foreign exchange uh, management, uh, we, ha we have uh, hearing, uh, we are hearing that about de-dollarization. I don't know de-dollarization could be uh, how much it will be effective or not. For Bangladesh experience, we have seen uh, there are talking to, as uh, Professor Zahid Hussain mentioned, opening uh, EUN account and also uh, trade possibility with India in rupee. Uh, what you have seen is that actually uh, if you don't have almost, you, you have to have a, some sort of balanced trade with each country and if you don't have it, uh, it will be difficult to implement. Uh, for example, um, with India or with China, we do have a huge uh, uh, deficit of uh, trade. And that means you have to pay them back. If, uh, for example, if you talk about China, we don't, we don't print yuan. We have to manage uh, yuan to pay their money, even if we are going for vehicle country or bilateral arrangement. So for this reason, even uh, it has been seen that some of the uh, traders, some of the exporters from China, that is we are importer, they also preferred uh, dollar, not yuan. So for obvious reason, dollar is a dominant, country, dominant, uh, dominant uh, uh, currency and it has a stability we have seen over the years. It has also um, a strength, inner, inner strength of the um, global market. So uh, we can uh, search for uh, uh, appropriate opportunity, appropriate time. And that uh, means that we, we should not uh, give up the hope of having some uh, common currency issues. Uh, I think uh, from me, uh, time is not yet, we are not ready yet. And uh, maybe down the road, there will be some time we'll be having to see that. Thank you very much. Thank you. For saving one minute for this panel. So thanks a lot uh, and finishing it in seven minutes. Uh, excellent. Uh, let me now invite Dr. Pridashi Dash uh, uh, from RIS in India. Uh, thank you, Chair. I'll um, uh, not repeat what has been already mentioned, but I just want to uh, uh, bring some ideas before uh, the esteemed panel and colleagues here that we, we have to go beyond the short-term priorities that we have. That's why I kept some ideas and choices. So what I'm going to do, uh, briefly mention about some debt-related issues and what is the future of debt management. and. 
the macroeconomic preparedness for the region in response to what is happening around globally, uh, which is beyond the short term response and how do we prioritize that. Uh, if you look at the short term debt, which is a worrying indicator, no, many times when we see that whether we are close to any financial crisis or not, whether the situation worsens, this is the indicator we mostly look at. So uh, not of that disturbing uh, trend we see here. I also saw the projections up to 2028 of world economic outlook, uh, not much a concern, so I don't want to uh, spend time much here. But what I want to highlight here, which was very much emphasized by uh, Rizomac governor uh, a couple of months back, that we were witnessing a change in the composition of the debt. A share of the uh, private creditors have increased. Uh, from 46% in 2010 to 61% in 2021. And then the share of debt of the bondholders has increased to, from 29% to 47% during that period. So what does it mean? It means the way you are resolving the debt or the uh, debt management strategy is not the same. It, is, it has become more complex. Of course, it is helpful that you need market to offer that financing choices for the countries, but it has brought uh, the complexities as well. So what are the choices you have as far as the debt management is concerned? We go by the test book rules, continue to get access to the IMF uh, funding, sovereign debt restructuring to continue. But in addition to that, we need to see a much larger picture that how the private creditors take part in DSSI kind of initiatives uh, or any similar kind of debt management strategies. If you see the G20 Indian presidencies are precisely mentioned on that aspects that the global sovereign debt roundtable to take it forward, that there are effective debt resolution mechanisms. And the Indian presidency has facilitated the meeting between official creditor committee and the borrowing countries to settle it amicably. Ghana, Ethiopia, Sri Lanka and uh, uh, Zambia were the examples of that. Now, why I brought ODA here, I just want to see that what type of financing window we have. If you think of resolving debt, do you have enough of ODA flows to uh, the countries? Do you have enough of FDI? ODA has fallen. You can see from this graph, FDI flows, even though it is increasing, it is not a significant part of the capital formation in the, uh, of course, it's contributed to capital formation, but not a significant person, a lot of potential for, their, for the FDI flows to come. So in that case, the countries need borrowing from the market and external uh, uh, sources. Uh, Dr. Hussein was mentioning currency swap arrangement. I was just checking my one of my old presentations where we had prepared this that how South Asian countries are having currency swap arrangements. Of course, they can rely on that. Now, here is the point when I say that what would be the medium term macroeconomic response from the region, what is happening in globally, rest of the world and in the region. We need to recognize that the region must grow. And we need to leverage on those sectors. Services sector output is increasing, trade in services is increasing. We need to leverage on that. Digitalization is hap happening across sectors. And it could be a transform transformative force. Labor force composition is changing, certain skills are becoming redundant, and new skills are getting created. So, skilling, reskilling, we need to focus. FinTech, e commerce, advanced digital technology become the platform, that's become the language of business in the future. You need to harness that. And infrastructure development continue to be a catalyst. Of course, the quality and resilience dimension is a new addition. Green transition is happening. You need to be climate consistent so that these are the forces. Of course, energy solutions we are doing. Now, what does it mean? You need to orient your national macroeconomic policy to leverage on these forces, but at, not at the cost of short-term stabilization. Uh, here I thought of bringing fintech because I work in this area, though what is the what is happening. So a lot of momentum in this uh, uh, sector, uh, just keeping this for sake of time. Uh, just to mention here that fintech platforms are not just for retail payment settlements. They are serving a very underserved segment of the uh, borrowing class. The, uh, and that, that's what precisely uh, I bring here. And who are the people who would be benefiting from the fintech solutions? Street vendors who do not have any collateral, denied credit for by the banks. Agricultural migrant, gig workers, 
homemakers, they don't have access to formal capital market. They need money of, say, hundred dollar, even fifty dollar. Who would fund them? These are the solutions. Of course, there are risks below that. I am saying that this is a value chain, fintech value chain that it, it increases to literacy, then banking services, and all those value added components. Now, coming to the infrastructure, we cannot compromise with infrastructure funding. We need more funding. Public sector funding has to continue, but it should help crowd in private capital. And this is the situation in 2021 that we have equity, which is 35 percent of the total private sector for participation in the infrastructure funding. Debt is 64. And the healthy thing is that local currency debt is 26 percent of that, which should increase so that the cost of borrowing can go down. So in that case, what would be the policy preparedness for uh, South Asia? South Asia should keep growing. We are growing. We must continue to grow. But at the same time, to deal with high inflation, fuel, uh, energy crisis that we witness today in the future, we need to secure supplies of essential goods, fuel, energy through diversified supply chains, not just to depending on uh, Russia or Ukraine. Or, we have to think that there is a diversified supply chain so that we do not end up paying uh, more for our import bills. And then minimizing vulnerability, which is a common sense uh, textbook notion. Uh, and regional financial cooperation. Uh, Dr. Hussein and in the morning, it has been already presented that we are no way close to a common currency kind of framework. The ideal conditions for a common currency is far uh, from uh, what we are experiencing today. And he mentioned a couple of, of that similarity of socks, high trade integration, labor market uh, mobility, and all these. But we should not be uh, disappointed in that, that we have something at present that is trade, uh, trade in local currency, which uh, um, Chair mentioned in the beginning. I had a paper uh, three, four years back uh, on rupee trade, where uh, we, we tried to analyze that how uh, the rupee trade provisions with India, Nepal, India, Russia, India, East, East European countries before uh, the uh, breakdown of USSR worked. And it, it sort of provided a mechanism of settling the, uh, the, the trade payments in your local currency. And you don't have to buy. You are referring to how it would happen. You don't have to buy dollar. There is a Vostra account. Uh, this is the last uh, um, um, slide itself. So the, there is a Vostra account. Indian exporters, uh, Indian importers uh, will pay for their oil bills to the bank in Indian rupee. And the export proceedings of the other counterpart in Indian rupee will pay for the imports from uh, India. So that was the case. But there are problems of imbalance that if a country is exporting more, then there is an imbalance and there will be surplus uh, money of either currency. So there, there are a lot of possibilities in doing that. So to sum it up, um, my point is that stabilization of the macroeconomy in terms of managing inflation, uh, managing say uh, foreign exchange reserves, these are standard tools that we keep on um, uh, employing from time to time. But we need to prepare our institutions, our central bankers, our, our thinkers to prepare the regions to go to the next phase of, of the growth, which is much more intense and competitive landscape guided by a digitalization of fintech, e-commerce platforms. We need to uh, face such, uh, such, such kind of uh, opportunities. Thank you for the opportunity. Uh, thank you. Thanks, Dash. Let me now bring in uh, uh, Dr. Abid Suleri, Executive Director, SDPI, uh, for his remarks. Well, uh, thank you, uh, Chair. And as uh, uh, John Kennelly, uh, the Treasury Secretary of uh, Richard Nixon, uh, back in 1971, very famously said that uh, to his European counterparts, so he said that uh, US dollar is our currency, but it's your problem. At that time, it was uh, the problem for Europe, but uh, now, uh, of course, the dollar has become a global uh, problem. And uh, the reason I'm saying that it, it has become global problem that I agree with the, my previous speakers that perhaps uh, that time is not ripe in South Asia to have a common uh, currency. But uh, I think it's about time uh, that uh, uh, countries, uh, either they are uh, competitors uh, of uh, uh, U.S. economy, are they are friends of U.S. economy, uh, are they are part of U.S. economy, uh, are 
they need to think of uh, and again i'm not using the term de-dollarization i know it cannot happen uh, uh, at least in uh, near to medium future but they need to think of some sort of uh, alternatives uh, the reason i'm saying so because uh, if you uh, categorize uh, the powers uh, global powers uh, i think there are three criteria uh, influence uh, military and economy and uh, one can say that uh, an economy the world is a, a multipolar world in case of uh, military we know that uh, we are living in sort of uh, bipolar world uh, united states and china and in case of influence it's still unipolar world so it's uh, united states uh, that uh, has to get involved whether it is a middle eastern conflict or its ukrainian conflict or its uh, conflict anywhere uh, by, by virtue of uh, its uh, influence uh, now most of the south asian countries uh, almost all of us uh, we uh, want to have our non aligned policies uh, whereby uh, we uh, have to have uh, uh, good terms and good relations uh, with all the uh, these three powers economic powers military powers and uh, in terms of influence uh, but uh, the problem in having uh, uh, this uh, good relations uh, or uh, balance balancing act uh, we can uh, very easily uh, offend uh, any of uh, these powers uh, especially uh, the military power and economic uh, power uh, say india which is now the fifth uh, largest uh, uh, economy uh, uh, by virtue of uh, your uh, uh, procurement of energy from russia uh, or uh, from uh, iran uh, there can be uh, some sort of secondary or tertiary sanctions uh, uh, which can be uh, invoked similarly in case of pakistan if pakistan is buying now uh, the crude oil from uh, russia uh, if we are making these payments through swift mechanism and through dollars uh, at some stage we can perhaps uh, invite secondary or tertiary uh, sanction and same is uh, uh, in case of our uh, uh, energy transact uh, trade with the iran uh, which is under uh, sanction so to avoid those sanctions uh, or to uh, have uh, some sort of uh, uh, independent uh, mechanism uh, there is a, a need uh, uh, of de-dollarization or at least reducing this uh, dollarization now in case of pakistan i can tell you that what we are uh, doing we are uh, relying on barter trade uh, pakistan has already signed a barter trade agreement uh, with afghanistan with iran with russia uh, and uh, one with china uh, is being proposed uh, china industrial and commercial bank has established its uh, yuan clearing bank uh, in karachi uh, so the commercial banks in pakistan they can uh, buy and sell uh, uh, yuan uh, the uh, pakistan is making uh, Uh, the payment uh, to uh, russia for the crude oil in jawan uh, uh, so uh, these are uh, some of the uh, things that uh, we uh, have been doing uh, but uh, going back to uh, this uh, macroeconomic uh, uh, cooperation uh, i think uh, these are the measures which are uh, quite uh, temporary now uh, again uh, mindful of the fact that we cannot have a common uh, currency uh, but uh, let me bring another piece of jigsaw puzzle here and that is uh, Uh, climate change and loss and damage fund that we have been uh, talking about in cop 27 uh, now my argument is that even if we get this loss and damage fund uh, uh, founded uh, if it has to uh, uh, work uh, uh, under the same model uh, the ifis imf and world bank uh, the world climate vulnerable country they would never succeed and pakistan is one of the example after the super floods of uh, last september 2022 Uh, the geneva pledges of 9 billion dollar which were made uh, so far we can only get uh, less than 1 billion dollar initially the uh, condition was that pakistan has to be under this imf framework uh, imf uh, uh, umbrella program and now once uh, pakistan is uh, under this imf umbrella program there are again lot of ifs and buts here and there is uh, this uh, opportunity uh, for proposing an alternative to uh, bretton wood institute uh, Uh, at least for climate change or climate financing for loss and damage uh, financing and uh, my proposal would be that uh, uh, india south asian countries uh, as part of g77 uh, plus china perhaps they can uh, uh, propose uh, some sort of virtual currency uh, just like uh, special drawing rates uh, str so 
debt currency would not have any political connotation or any uh, political uh, implications. Uh, but uh, uh, at least in order to take care of uh, climate vulnerabilities, if that sort of arrangement uh, can be initiated and climate change is an uh, uh, sector where uh, we will not be uh, creating uh, any uh, annoyance or any uh, insecurity uh, to any uh, bigger small economy uh, if we uh, wa can link it with the loss and damage or uh, other funds. And that would uh, uh, in turn also help in uh, DSSI. Uh, so we are talking of now a lot of virtual things. We are talking of carbon markets. We are talking of carbon credits. And uh, we are talking of uh, various other uh, financial uh, instruments uh, uh, that are uh, quite virtual in nature and quite innovative. So uh, I think instead of losing my hope on a common currency, uh, I would try to explore any uh, opportunity uh, for such innovative solution uh, whereby uh, the South Asian countries, they can reduce their dependence on uh, dollar and they can support each other uh, in pursuit of macroeconomic stability. Thank you. Thanks, Abid Bhai, for, for very, very interesting uh, uh, idea of a virtual currency for uh, a loss and damage fund. Excellent. Let me now bring in uh, Dr. Uh, Asan Habib Mansoor uh, for his remarks. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I will not go into the issue of common currency because it's already been discussed quite comprehensively. And I know that it's a, it's a pie in the sky. But I will discuss this, what we can do now in terms of taking the baby steps that can maybe several decades later can eventually take us there. So the areas that we need to think of are several that has been touched upon and I will go a little bit deeper on those. Trade issues for example. This is the very old traditional way of starting relationship, economic relationship and generally it creates a uh, what you call a clientele to support interdependency, economic relationship, investment, and so on. So I will emphasize more focus on trade facilitation first. And for that, some progress has been made between Bangladesh and India, for example. I'm sure a similar thing may have happened with Nepal and Bhutan, and uh, unfortunately not with Pakistan, but that's, a, a, that's an issue that also needs to be thought through. Now. Um, that can also spread like using simple things like common docu documentation for trade f facilitation purpose. Why we have one set of documentation for Bangladesh, other set for India, uh, and other set for Nepal, and, and, and so on and so forth. We can standardize it. It's doable. If something practical, we should try. Investment, we should do more. We know that uh, Cross-regional investment is, the performance is very poor. And when you talk about FDI, you talk about foreigners outside South Asians. And that something needs to change because investment, the number one should be the neighbors. If you go to Canada, it is the US. If you go to Mexico, it is the US. But where is the Indian investors in Bangladesh or in other countries? So we, we need to think through that. People to people relation, is very important and there's a lot of goodwill and a lot of uh, cultural uh, affiliation, affinity, etc., etc. But still, visa issue, border control issues are still quite pervasive and quite uh, old-fashioned and, and, and there is a lot that can be done in that way. Exchange and payment system harmonization will be very critical if you want to be practical on that. First of all, I will say that the authorities should discuss how to reduce the distortions, even as simple things as in the current account convertibility today. I know that Bangladesh said in 2003 that we are current account convertible. Are we fully? No. Same thing may apply to others. And let's look at it, try to make it what we already put it on our papers, our documentations, a reality on the ground. We are not there. If you look at it, say how Indian rupee as a payment currency, 
it has been discussed. I will not go very deep into it, but I would suggest that to make it a starting point, we need to have, given that large trade imbalance, we need to have a large line of credit to make it popular. A large line of credit will make it popular so that Bangladeshis can avail that, import Indian goods and so on. Of course, there will be accumulation of debt, but that is going to happen in dollar anyway. So, rate in Indian rupee, and so so that that's one way to make it popular. Otherwise, it's the performance as we have seen, vis-a-vis -vis yuan, vis-a-vis -vis Indian rupee, is dismal, and it's not going to go very far in the current state of affairs. Now, we should also think of currency swap to protect against external shocks and uh, that we are facing and also individual countries uh, payments problem. For example, um, countries like uh, India, Japan has a, has a swap, but why not India, Bangladesh? Why not India, Sri Lanka or India, Nepal? We, we should think about that so that uh, and, and the only country that can currently provide that kind of soft convertible resources, it can be both in, in rupee swap and it can be in dollar swap. So that's both possible, but India has to take the lead because only India has surplus reserves, a significant amount of reserves that a certain small part can be allocated, 20 million dollars, not a big deal, but that can go a long way in terms of creating the protection mechanism within the region, practical just tax policy harmonization, very important issue. Here I would say first is, is, is the trade, uh, trade policy like customs duty rationalization across countries. We are not there, we are very far off. Bangladesh has a lot to do in that regard as well. Our duty rates are very high and we need to bring it down on our part, for example. So average 28, 28 percent is not going to help the regional trade. We need, to, we need to discuss these issues and reduce it. Corporate income tax policy also needs to be harmonized because otherwise profit shifting can take place and, and that is something that collectively we should work on. Coming to the monetary policy harmonization, we know that if you want to even think of any kind of uh, stable relationship in the financial sense, stable currencies uh, or currency exchange rates, we have to think about bringing inflation close to each other. And that means there will be need for some degree of monetary cooperation in that regard. That will also help reduce the cross-country exchange rate stability, which is important factor. You cannot fully stabilize it, but we should minimize the exchange rate volatility to help uh, regional trade and that is very important and so monetary policy mechanism needs to be harmonized as well. What will be the institutional arrangements for that to happen? Yes, cooperation at the institutional level will be critical in that regard. It has to be like institutions like central bank can sit together every quarter. The governors can sit together once in a quarter or or so, and they can discuss inflation differential, what can be done about it, country cu currency stability, what can be done about it. So interest rate issues between countries, very weird policies are taken in, in different countries, including fixation of interest rate in Bangladesh, for example, contrary to general trend. So these, these are the issues that, that needs to be discussed and one can learn from the others. And the good practices, for example, how India has overcome or made itself excel during this global economic crisis, the current round of crisis, uh, is a lesson to learn for others, their colleagues in, in, in Bangladesh, in Nepal, in Sri Lanka and others. So, so there are good practices that can be propagated through that kind of consultation. Ministry of Commerce should also trade, talk, uh, among the different countries should also talk with each other on trade facilitation, reduction or elimination of restrictions, etc., etc. Tax authorities, customs authorities, they need to 
sit among with their counterparts. Finally, I would also say the Home Ministry is also an issue. And we need to issue the visa issues along with border killing. I mean, this is something very sensitive issue. Nowhere in the world people are killed for crossing border. You can arrest them, put them to the judicial system, but don't kill them. So this is an issue that's also this is a very sentimental issue in Bangladesh, and that needs to be addressed for the greater interest, long-term interest of relationship between countries. Finally, I would say that depoliticization of Bangladesh issue like in Assam and certain other places is very important because we know, we know that with Bangladesh nearly two and a half thousand US dollar per capita income and Assam half of that, nobody is going from here to Assam today. So that's not an issue, it's a political issue. It needs to be tackled politically and not politicize the issue that will harm, that will harm the economic progress relationship between the countries. Let's work together with these baby steps. Let's move our siblings, South Asian siblings, grow together over time. And only then we can think of going to a common currency issue. Maybe several decades later. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, thanks, Dr. Mansoor, for your remarks. Uh, let me now invite uh, Dr. Poshraj Pandey. Uh, uh, for for uh, whom we heard in the uh, plenary. Thanks, and yeah, please go ahead. Thank you, Chair. Okay, let me start with the current macroeconomic issues for the South Asian countries. Number one, slowdown in growth rate compared to pre-pandemic level. That's the one. Second, our financial system is quite vulnerable. I would say it has become vulnerable. Third, our fiscal position is fragile and maybe in future because of this election induced expenditure, we are going to lose I mean, that fiscal space. And fourth, that's the, that is high debt to GDP ratio. And World Bank reports that out of I mean, some eight countries, maybe half are related, half are related to a near sovereign debt stress. So we have, I mean, that, that high debt, debt GDP ratio. Well, I mean, against this, I mean, macroeconomic issues, what could be our, I mean, priority, particularly from macroeconomic policy perspective? The first one would, would be to preserve our financial stability and also improve our fiscal sustainability. I mean, these two are for the short run. And for the long run, to boost our private investment, make economies more open, explore new avenues for exports, I mean, maybe particularly in the service sector, and also reduce transaction cost, I mean, among us. So here, I mean, is it possible? And the question is, we have that kind of problem and we should have that kind of a priority. The question is, is it possible to harmonize our macroeconomic policy and have common currency? I mean, I fully agree with previous speakers that it's premature to have common currency. As, I mean, we don't satisfy the condition identified by Mundell and Mackinnon. That is one, free movement of factory production. Second, that's the diversified economy. And, and uh, I'm, I mean, we won't be able I mean, to satisfy, I don't want to I mean, enumerate all those conditions, we won't be able to satisfy those I mean, conditions. So what would be the option? Options could be moderate starting. Uh, and there could be, I mean, various measure for moderate starting and what our friends said, I mean, baby step. Uh, and I propose, I mean, a few of the measures which are 
interrelated and would support to each other. The first one could be, I mean, we, we, we can have I mean, a, this payment union, but that has to be supported by currency swap, as suggested by Dr. Hussein. That is one option. And second options could be Rigor pulling, I mean, particularly we have seen I mean, that, 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 that is stress to Sri Lanka and also Pakistan. So we can have, we can have um, some measure of uh, rigor pulling and, and we, 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 we can get, say, for, from Chiang Mai, uh, Chiang Mai Initiative of Multilateralism, CMIM. We, we can learn I mean, the experience of that um, rigor pooling system. That is second option. And the third option is exchange rate cooperation. I mean, for exchange rate cooperations, I think I mean, there, are, there could be three options. One, okay, we can have anchor currency within the region. For example, in CMA countries, Namibia member countries, CMA members, Namibia, Lithoso, has big their currency to South African RAD. Well, maybe in our case, maybe India can take a lead. One option. And second option, as Abid Bhai I mean, suggested, to create I mean, some sort of common currency like SDR. And you can pick I mean, with that currency. That could be the second option. And third options could be as practiced in ASEAN plus three. That is the external currency with dollars. That's the, 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 that's the for informal arrangement to pay with dollar. That, that, that's the way, I mean, these are the options for our uh, foreign exchange cooperation. And the last one could be, I mean, I think I mean, that is much more important to increase investment, particularly private investment. And we can create I mean, some sort of regional financial market. And in that financial market, we can issue local currency bond or, I mean, stock in the local currency. Well, I mean, this could be our, this could be our options, I mean, to start with our macroeconomic policy coordinations as well as I mean, monetary policy coordinations. Okay, I stop over here. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, uh, uh, thanks a lot, uh, 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 Dr. Pushraj Pandey, for uh, bringing forward several reminders and several uh, caveats in terms of what the strategy should look like and what kind of engagements we can really have for our friends as uh, intent was. Uh, we have saved some minutes for uh, discussion and uh, uh, for intervention from the floor. Uh, you have heard uh, uh, the general consensus from, the, from this side of the table, this end of the table, uh, on uh, time that hasn't come for common currency. That's everyone saying. What steps, what sequencing, uh, what measures, what additional features to facilitate, what lessons to learn, what course corrections, et cetera, et cetera. Cost and, uh, and advantage of uh, those choices have also been discussed. I'm not summarizing at this point, but largely that's the contour we have tried to cover. Now I open it up for uh, uh, comments, discussions, ideas uh, that are there. Kindly identify yourself. Please be as brief as possible and, uh, and uh, help us manage time better so that we can go to the next plenary well in time. And I already see the governor. So uh, my governor, please take the floor. Thank you very much. Uh, very rich discussion. I think I don't want to repeat what was discussed. Uh, I think bottom line, as you quite nicely summarize, to me, um, is obviously premature to talk about common currency. It's, it's a waste of time to me. I mean, just simply put it that way. But having said that, uh, there are other things as shown by uh, several presenters, presenters that can have a 
integration in terms of digitalization, uh, in terms of payment settlements, all these things obviously can work towards more integration of economic and financial activities across the region. That, that's all, I think already there is agreement. But when it comes to common currency, I think one additional thing that I would like to add in addition to what already said is to think about the uh, common currency versus reserve currency. I think that we look at why this some of the currencies have become reserve currencies in some large, say, US dollar, euro, yen, and then gradually the yuan is now into SDR basket. I think it's, it's mainly the one is the economic power of the global economy, that's how it has those emerged. Secondly, that is n even not sufficient. Secondly, this currency's liquidity, acceptability, convertibility, and global offshore markets develop to hedge those exposures. For example, now, if you look at all the uh, reserve currencies, including small uh, economies like New Zealand dollar, Australian dollar, there are very developed offshore markets where one can, one can hedge and a lot of instruments to deal with in the global financial markets. I think that is second requirement. One is the size of the global share of the economy. Second is ability to have offshore. So the, the question is that, uh, what are, I mean, I, I can see uh, more than common currency, what we need to look at, what are the currencies that can become a reserve, become reserve currency going forward. The obvious candidates are China and India, obviously, given the increasing share of the global economy, but that is not necessarily sufficient. Uh, there's the other part is that the allowing convertibility and uh, allowing offshore trading and local convertibility, full convertibility. That's where even without strong economic powers, why central banks still holding certain amounts of New Zealand dollar, even Australian dollar? It's not because those are strong economies or strong currencies, but because those are the, the features of those currencies would certainly, even small economy like oh, that, that currency can become a reserve currency at some point, but can't come to the level of, but in INR and I think Yuan has a potential in my view for a period of time, but to, be, to come to that level, need to have that same features that other currencies need to have. Otherwise, I think way forward to me, is to increase the basket of reserve currencies. This is the best, is something that we can think about. Common currency, I think even ASEAN, ASEAN, I don't think there will ever be a common currency. It's highly unlikely. I think they, they, there could be individual currencies. Thank you. Thank you, Governor. Thank you. Uh, yes, please. Uh, I'm Vishwas Gautin, IIDS, Kathmandu, Nepal. Uh, as a researcher, it's, it's a foregone conclusion for me that uh, common currency is not a reality, at least in my lifetime. Uh, and the, the basic concept of uh, common currency is, I think, uh, goes back to uh, the, the concept introduced by Robert Mundell uh, back in mid-60s about the optimum currency area, which essentially means that uh, because the macroeconomic policies are to respond for different shocks, and, and we are so asymmetric across all the countries in the region, uh, having a common currency and common monetary policy doesn't work at all. So uh, that gives us a premise to not to talk about. Uh, it's pre pretty premature. And when SAFTA is not working, still a long way to go. Uh, I think talking about uh, uh, common currency is just too far. And I think that the way forward in the transition could be uh, regionalization of Indian rupees. Uh, Indian rupees as a vehicle currency. Mm. And in that process, I think uh, 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 India has to run a consistent current account deficit. And that's also not a possibility because it's in, in the interest of India to have uh, current account uh, you know, deficit overall, but uh, within uh, the region, it, it enjoys uh, a phenomenal uh, kind of current account surplus uh, because Nepal has to be uh, happens to be I think the third largest uh, you know provider of uh, trade surplus uh, as far as uh, India and Nepal is concerned and with, uh, Nepal Bangladesh and Sri Lanka are the top ten countries providing the highest trade surplus for India so to compensate for that as uh, uh, as our speaker said that I think running a current 
capital account deficit, uh, but how sustained that would be. I think that's something uh, to look upon. And as far as the reserve currency is concerned, I think Nepal has already uh, has an exposure of around 45% of uh, its total foreign exchange reserves in India as a country, and as an Indian rupee, around 25%. We have around $11 billion plus uh, foreign exchange reserves, and which is quite a huge amount as far as the, if in relation to our size of GDP. So, uh, so in that sense, I think uh, uh, for, for India to, uh, you know, take up its aspiration to in, inter, internationalize its currency in the medium to long term, I think the first step is to regionalize uh, and, and make sure that uh, the trust on Indian rupee uh, comes comes uh, with that process, and I would just like to cite one example uh, where, where there's so much of mistrust uh, because uh, demonetization. Uh, used, I think that was back in 2016, and Nepal used to hold uh, Indian rupees in 501,000 denominations, and that was never honoured. Uh, it was not a big amount for India; it's a few doll, uh, million rupees. But that has never been, uh, you know, settled. So these kind of, you know, <laughs> uh, uh, trust issues will always come. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks a lot. I can just take one more uh, intervention, maybe from that end of the table. Uh, I do not want the CG to be on this side. Maybe on the other side, uh, if anyone wants to take a floor, and then uh, we would uh, uh, close the panel. Anybody uh, from that end of the table? If not, I would come back to the speakers, and if they just want to make one minute intervention and then I would conclude. Anybody from that side of the table? I don't see any hands. Let me come back and go in the reverse order. Uh, so Dr. Mansoor, uh, do you want to say anything? Uh, I don't want to say much. I basically hope that South Asia as a yes. region yeah. can move forward. Move yes. forward collectively, grow together, support each other and 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 and, and the kind of practical steps, some of the examples that I gave, should be the starting point, no matter what. Thank you. If you can solve those small steps, we can move to the bigger challenges down the line and succeed. Thank you. The, uh, the small steps that you counted, they themselves, each one, is such a huge that we would take <laughs> rather long. Anyway, Abid Bhai, you, you would pass. Uh, 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 Dash, Pridashi Dash. Uh, to our uh, colleagues from uh, who just mentioned, you know, you don't have to necessarily run current account deficit at this stage. Of course, the trust thing that you mentioned that uh, that is very valid. If you go by the Mundal framework, also there has to be anchor currency to do that. And uh, the the uh, the first requirement is the transaction in that currency has to increase, which is happening. If you see among the emerging market currencies, Chinese yuan, Indian rupee, and other emerging market currencies, their share in invoicing is increasing. And as far as India providing an ecosystem for such type of financial sector cooperation to happen in the region, you know this International Financial Service Center is coming at Gibb City in Gandhinagar, where all these uh, uh, currency related, financial related issues, legal issues, earlier uh, be it India and other things, they used to go to Singapore and Hong Kong to okay. settle all these things. All these things are going to happen in India, in Gandhinagar, and the gift city. So uh, that serving as an international financial service center would mitigate most of the, the cost dimension of that, and that would help evolve the ecosystem to build uh, trust around uh, the anchor currency. Thank you. Thanks, Dash. Three of my uh, panelists are extremely gracious and they have agreed not to take any more uh, interventions. So I think uh, uh, this panel is all set to get closed uh, very well in time for the plenary. Uh, before uh, I close, I just want to make one point and I, I think uh, uh, which is important in terms of we realizing the fact that uh, uh, the dominance of dollar that we saw over the years is, is not something which is mere geopolitics. Of course, the United States might have thought of this uh, as a great uh, 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 geopolitics to get uh, US dollar dominating the system. 
but there is a huge cost us is now paying for uh, uh, for being a dominant currency it's not easy to be global leader and uh, and it has its own toll on the system the amount of inflation that us economy is uh, is going through and the inability of fed uh, to rein in inflation uh, that is the the amount of us dollar which is outside circulation and 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 floating globally is not easy for uh, fat to control the inflation so i do not think if india should remain in any illusion to uh, globalize at the cost of regionalization or sequence them in the other way i think uh, uh, it should remain purely uh, a business transaction it should remain uh, with the sole objective of uh, reducing the cost of transaction for everybody whether we go for uh, uh, the uh, common currency whether we go for uh, uh, a reserve currency as honorable governor pointed out i think we would have to see the uh, 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 interest of our businessmen of the community of south asia we would have to see how uh, uh, some of these dimensions can can expand i would very much request uh, uh, cpd and and i see dr famida is here uh, uh, to uh, to get a small group constituted uh, to see uh, how uh, 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 says can take this idea of uh, uh, financial integration in the in the region forward and we need to bring in some minds together uh, to identify uh, uh, five points which have emerged in today's uh, 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 discussions uh, i'm i'm very uh, much delighted that dr uh, zaid hussain talked about uh, uh, why us dollar and and what we are actually saving when we are talking of uh, 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 taka rupee settlement what, what is it that is there this question may not be very valid for uh, countries which have already emerged as major exporters to india like bhutan so so we buy huge power for them uh, almost 40 million dollars and uh, we are also exporting to so two of us can can easily do that nepal is emerging as a major exporter of energy and nepal can can also do that uh, india bangladesh we would have to see what kind of trade transaction with sri lanka currency swap arrangement is already a reality it has already happened with the uh, with sri lanka so uh, so i do not see uh, any reason for that the second point uh, uh, that uh, uh, came in uh, uh, very much uh, uh, from dr rahman you uh, uh, is uh, is important in terms of uh, what would happen to national policy making national sovereignty that the point that you raised and i think uh, uh, same was dash's perspective in terms of uh, uh, the debt management strategy the national governments and they take that that would come in and and you also very rightly pointed out uh, dash uh, on uh, on policy preparedness uh, 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 that is uh, that is needed uh, uh, i was also delighted with the uh, uh, the suggestion that came from abid bhai uh, in terms of the virtual currency and and how we operationalize uh, new instruments so even if we do not uh, see system uh, uh, afresh maybe some uh, uh, peace mill initiatives particularly for uh, loss and damage fund and some similar uh, uh, plurilaterals that uh, uh, professor rahman subhan mentioned today i think are are, are extremely important uh, 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 it was also uh, 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 good to hear dr mansoor you uh, in terms of uh, the baby steps and trade facilitation is absolutely uh, the right way to to uh, begin with fortunately in trade facilitation uh, uh, institutions which are involved in south asia economic summit uh, seven studies have been done on trade facilitation measures we all have been part of those studies so fortunately after uh, the wto's uh, 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 agreement on trade facilitation things have moved very fast but you are uh, uh, right we can do some uh, uh, ex ante study on uh, large lines of credit uh, uh, that that was there but i remember <coughs> in 2011 when pranam mukherjee came to uh, bangladesh uh, 1 billion dollar line of credit was given and immediately after demand from bangladesh in 2012 india had to turn 700 million dollars into grant so that uh, uh, 
uh, a market based operation requires a huge uh, 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 um, uh, um, arrangement that is needed but your point on tax policy harmonization i think requires further study uh, uh, within uh, quad and within uh, uh, g20 uh, this discussion has moved forward among the g20 countries but i think if uh, uh, um, uh, uh, other uh, south asian countries are are willing to get uh, linked with the growth story of india uh, i think it would be a win win partnership and we need to uh, uh, to, uh, to to bring in your idea of uh, inflation study would also make a uh, lot of sense uh, dr poshraj pandey has made two very important suggestions uh, uh, one is uh, of uh, uh, anchor currency and and regional uh, uh, financial markets and uh, and a local uh, uh, currency bank that that we can think of so this uh, set of uh, suggestions that have come in have helped us uh, uh, manage our time very well uh, of this panel but also uh, some suggestions that i wanted uh, uh, the south asia economic summit to pick up uh, from our panel for the main recommendations of this i think uh, 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 would be very important and relevant so big hand for my panel uh, and i hope organizers are happy with our time management so you thank you thank you for a big hand for her to remind us of time thank you good great great